He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I overcame and sat down with my Father, To the angel of the church to Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich in white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, she who has a need, let her hear what the Spirit says to the church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what we've heard today and experienced is, is far, from, far from lukewarm, far from passionless. But Lord, we don't want to just be going through motions. So we need you to help us today. And give us ears one more time that hear what your spirit would say to the churches. In Jesus' name, amen. Laodicea. To just say the name in proper Adventist circles, 
is to suggest more than one might intend and to have implied more than one might want to hear. Laodicea. To call someone Laodicean is in our tribe like unto a curse. The worst that a proper Adventist could within acceptable protocol someone call someone who isn't doing what that proper Adventist thinks they should be doing, you're Laodicean. Laodicea. The name carries guilt and shame and the suggestion that not only are you not a very good Adventist, you likely aren't even saved. So much so have we used this name against each other that in many circles, it's lessons that might be very useful to those people. In many circles, the name is essentially banned by intentional neglect to the degree that it is possible a good number of our children seated here today don't know what Laodicean means. Laodicea. Whether or not the name ought to carry such baggage is probably not the proper question. Likely it should. Whether or not we should club each other over the head with this name, however, is another matter. Laodicea. The funny thing is, it would have been quite easy and quite enjoyable, probably, to be a member in Laodicea. Easy, but maybe easy was one of the primary problems. You know, we think we like easy, but who ever got passionate about easy? People all over America didn't stay up way past their bedtimes Wednesday night watching the World Series because once again, as per usual, the Cubbies won. No. America didn't watch because it was easy. They watched because it's so hard to win the World Series that the Cubs hadn't done it in 108 years. Ellen White was alive the last time (laughs) they won the series. Yep. But easy isn't the only issue. We don't just generate passion by making it difficult. If that were true, then we would expect every high schooler in America to be passionate about Algebra (laughs) 2. And the trials and challenges in a marriage would automatically drive couples together, passionately together, not apart. Well, sometimes trials do that, but often they don't. So where does this passion come from? And how does it slip away? Laodicea. We have come to the seventh church in our fall series entitled Candles. It's based on Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the letters to the seven churches. We're actually going to spend two more weeks in this series, but this is the last of the specific focuses on the letters. Next Sabbath, we're going to talk about Revelation 4 and the scene at the throne of God. And then for Festival Sabbath on November 19, which this was a nice preparation for that day, on November 19, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 5, and that's going to be an awesome day, so make sure you're here. Next week is, for me, a week of fasting and prayer, and to anyone else that wants to join me, I will fast as I do each year towards the end of the fall series, and I invite you to join me in any way that you're able. Another special thing we'll be doing this next week is every evening from Monday through Thursday, I'll be here at the church at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary if you want to come and have a time of special prayer with me and some others that will be here. You're invited to do that. We'll also meet at 6 o'clock on Friday, but we have an elders event that evening as well. Here's the thing about fasting. Fasting isn't easy, 
But then maybe that's one of the reasons it's so important. You see, I don't suspect they did a whole lot of fasting in Laodicea. Laodicea. It was a rather lovely place to live. You see in this picture of, uh, of the ruins of the ancient city, this was an ancient bath there. And really now there is a small town, a small modern town nearby, but pretty much if you go there, it's just ruins out in the middle of farmer fields. It's pretty interesting how there really is nothing left of what used to be there. To give you an idea where Laodicea is, you can see on our map that we've looked at, down there in the, in the bottom left corner, that's Patmos, where John was writing, and then you've got Ephesus, and Smyrna, and Pergamum, and Thyatira, and Sardis, and then Philadelphia, and finally down there in the southeast corner, Laodicea. It's in a prosperous valley about 100 miles due east of Ephesus, situated between the ancient spa town of Hierapolis and the biblically famous city of Colossae. Now, Laodicea was a city known by the Apostle Paul, who makes interesting reference to it at the end of the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the, sisters and, to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. So you see, Laodicea is a church with a history. It even had its own letter from Paul. And in fact, if it hadn't been lost somewhere along the way, we'd have a book in the Bible probably called Laodiceans, just like we have a book in the Bible called Ephesians. Don't you wonder what that book said? Here's an ancient street from Laodicea. Get the idea that it was a decent place to live. Laodicea was famous for two things and infamous for one. One of the things it was famous for was a medical school known throughout the ancient world for its treatment of eye diseases by means of an eye salve made using Phrygian powder mixed with oil. But there was another thing as well. You see, Laodicea was involved in clothing manufacturing, and they specialized in fine quality, soft and glossy black wool textiles. There's a picture here of the amphitheater. All the decent cities had an amphitheater, and that's a big one sits on the side of the hill. It's pretty much in ruins now, but you can imagine what it was like in its day. Because of these, the eye salve and the, and the textiles, and because Laodicea sat squarely on a primary trade route going east, the Laodiceans were, compared to the citizens of the other cities around them, quite rich. According to Tacitus, the Roman historian when Laodicea was destroyed by an earthquake in the year A.D. 60, the emperor in Rome volunteered a little government money to help them get back on their feet. But you know what they said to Rome? We're rich and increased in goods. We don't need your help. And they rebuilt their own town, thereby limiting the influence of Rome upon their city. You remember Philadelphia had to have help, and it ended up the imperial cult was strong there. Well, Laodicea didn't need help, so Rome didn't affect them as much. Remember the eye salve and the fine black wool and the riches that they produced. We'll come back to these things in a minute. But I mentioned there were two things the city was famous for, and one for which it was infamous. You see, the biggest problem with Laodicea was the water. 
I mentioned Laodicea sat between Hierapolis and, and Colossae, and it was primarily from Hierapolis that the Laodiceans got their water. Now, I also mentioned Hierapolis was like a spa town. Here's the reason. Take a look at this picture. Isn't that beautiful? This is Hierapolis. You see, it sat right next to a fabulous artesian thermal feature which bubbled up hot water and does so to this day. And this mineral-rich water as it flows down the hillside creates these beautiful terraces that cool as they go down. And this is what made it the perfect spa because depending on, on how you were feeling and how hot of water you wanted, you just went to that level because the lower down you were, the cooler it was. The higher up you went, the hotter it was. That's a pretty good place to spend a little time, isn't it? An analog to this uh, geological feature is Mammoth Hot Springs, if you've ever seen that in Yellowstone National Park. It's very similar. But this is such a massive feature that covered the whole hillside with this bright white that was clearly visible from the city of Laodicea then and to this day. Now, at first, the presence of a feature like this close by might seem a nice advantage, and, and certainly the, the large quantities of thermal waters were nice. And all of that water was a boon for Laodicea, because where they were, they didn't have a natural water source. But the distance the water had to travel to get there was not necessarily a good thing. And the mineral content was a downright bane. It tasted terrible kind of wanted to spit it out of your mouth, if you know what I mean. You see, Laodicea piped its water through an aqueduct from Hierapolis, and the water that started out really hot at its source, by the time it had flowed six miles through the aqueduct to Laodicea was, well, can anyone guess? It's no longer hot, but I guess it wasn't really cold either. I don't know, maybe we'd say it was lukewarm? Now we're ready for the text. Revelation 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. It is a message that if you cared enough to hear it and you had ears that would hear, it's a message that might really hit home, don't you think? But then that's the problem. Did anyone in Laodicea ever care enough to listen? It's very difficult to get through to people who are neither hot nor cold. So why? What is missing? What has gone wrong in Laodicea? It's fascinating and remarkable to me how Jesus in this message confronts the Laodiceans precisely upon the points that they consider to be their strengths. Their wealth, their trade in eye salve, and their clothing manufacturing base. Jesus goes on, verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. There's an urgency to the message to Laodicea. It's a call for action. With Laodicea, you don't get one of those just hold on messages like is clearly stated with, with Smyrna and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and even implied with Pergamum. The message comes, just hold on, just hold on. But that's not the message to Laodicea. It's a call to action. There's probably a good reason why in, in certain of these churches, except for maybe Sardis, they are told mostly to just hold on. But Laodicea is told to act. You see, 
it seems persecution or the lack thereof plays a huge role in the life of a church. There was, it seems, varying degrees of persecution, is, as we've seen talking about it, in Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Philadelphia. But the opposite seems to have been the case. No persecution, apparently, in Ephesus, Sardis, and Laodicea. Jesus has only encouraging words for the places that have the least strength and the most persecution, Smyrna and Philadelphia. For Pergamum and Thyatira, where there's also persecution, Jesus has encouragement, but also words of caution to beware of heretical influences that are trying to find their way in. But in each case, there does not seem to be any need for Jesus in that church to address a lack of passion amongst the believers. And this should not really surprise us if you think about it. There's nothing like persecution to drive the uncommitted from the church because who's willing to suffer for something you aren't passionate about? So the persecuted churches aren't having a problem with passion. But there are three churches that don't seem to have a persecution problem. So what are the issues in these? Well, Ephesus. What happened with them? They lost their first love. Their passion is fading. Sardis. They needed to wake up. Their passion fell asleep. Laodicea. Neither hot nor cold. Their passion's gone. Now, interestingly, Ephesus, Sardis, Laodicea, theology doesn't seem to have been a particular problem in any of these churches, suggesting that it takes a lot more than good theology to have passion. I suggested in the introduction that the name Laodicea ought properly to carry with it a significant degree of guilt and shame, and the suggestion that one's soul is in fact endangered. Well, you tell me what you think. Do you think being spit out by Jesus is a good thing? No. And let me use Ephesus and Sardis and Laodicea to further support this contention. You see, I see these three churches as a progression of what happens all too often to unpersecuted, prosperous Christians. Step one, Ephesus. You lose your first love. You're still working, still looking good, still doing good, but you're already losing touch with your passion. Step two, Sardis. You start falling asleep. You still have a reputation for faithfulness, but in truth, you know you're not doing what you used to do when you built that reputation. The good works, the daily Bible reading and prayer, the gathering with other believers and sharing times of worship, sacrificial giving, fasting. Ah, it's just so exhausting, right? Step three, Laodicea. This is when the faith becomes more about the believers than it is about the one in whom they believe. This is the point where relationship dies. Here's the thing. The Laodiceans are probably still orthodox, but not really Christian anymore. Or at least not by any passionate meaning of that name. It had become more a cultural identity than a lifestyle. Verse 18 I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Jesus confronts the Laodiceans at the points that they believe to be their strengths. You think you're rich, but you're really poor. Contrast that with Smyrna. Do you remember with Smyrna? They were literally in poverty. But Jesus says, ah, but in truth you're rich. And here's Laodicea. Living well, but Jesus says you're poor. 
You think you're wearing fine black wool, but in fact, you're naked and wretched, is what Jesus says. And you think you can cure blindness with your fancy eye salve, but in truth, you're the ones that are blind. You have lots of stuff, Laodicea, and you're living well. But what you are calling your blessings are, in fact, the things that are destroying you. So what does Jesus tell them to do? They must act. Buy from Jesus gold. Buy from Jesus white clothes to wear. Buy from Jesus eye salve. That seems dumb, right? Why do they need to buy from Jesus precisely the things they already have? Well, how about, how about because in truth the things that they have and that they are depending on are worthless in eternity? The Laodiceans have proven well enough that they have a passion for the things that pass away. Now it's time for them to prove they have a passion for the things that are eternal. It's a hard word Jesus has brought to them, and it's a hard word without any praise. Of all the messages to all the churches, this is the only one that has no praise in it. But it is a hard word that proves Jesus' love. Verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. And what does it look like for Laodicea to be earnest and repent? Well, it's kind of funny, really, when you think about it. Not funny as in amusing, but funny as in ironic. For you see, passion comes back to Laodicea in such a simple way. Verse 20, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Is anybody here knocking? Well, are you going to open the door? You see, I can imagine the conversation. Oh, hi, Jesus. Sorry, I was busy. Didn't hear you knocking. Have you been there long? Jesus. Yes. Laodicea. A bit awkward after an uncomfortable silence where Jesus neither complains about the delay or dismisses it as nothing. So, would you like to come in for a minute? I'm sure you're busy. You probably can't stay long. Jesus. I'd love to come in, and look, I brought supper. Laodicea, oh, wow, great. I was going to order pizza again. (laughs) Jesus, yes, I know. You seem to answer the door soon enough when the pizza man knocks. (laughs) Laodicea, awkward again. Yes, right. Well, shall I get plates? Jesus, yes, but keep it simple. I mostly just want to sit and talk. You've been so busy building your kingdom. Are you still interested in mine? Is this a conversation Jesus needs to have with you? Do you hear knocking? Most of us in this room aren't really being persecuted for our faith, are we? There may be some, but most of us know. And while there are some here today in poverty and facing hard times, most of us are doing all right. Some of us are truly rich and increased in goods. And based on this alone, it is not without reason that we ought to carefully consider the continuum from Ephesus to Sardis to Laodicea 
with a sharp honesty. Where are you? Where am I in this progression? Ephesus? Lost your first love? Passion cooling a little? Yes, I know, Jesus, but I'm too busy doing your work to actually spend time with you. Sardis? Fallen asleep? Passion gone dormant? Oh, uh, sorry. Did you say something, Jesus? I, I must have dozed off for a second. What was it you wanted again? Laodicea? Just plain lukewarm? Passion gone? You know, lukewarm is so harsh. How about we call it reasonably balanced? Right? Not too hot, not too cold. Isn't that what we're going for? There's only one cure for Laodicea. You must act. You must open the door. See, Philadelphia, Jesus says, I set before you an open door. Laodicea, he knocks. You must act. You must open the door, invite Jesus in, and sit with him until the passion in your heart that you had at first comes to life again. Laodicea is not a theology problem. Laodicea is a relationship problem. And the only way to fix it is to clear your schedule and sit down to supper with Jesus. We need to rebuild our relationship with Jesus. Or better, we need to let him rebuild it. But for him to do that, we're going to have to answer the door and let him in. Now, I believe this point right here is exactly where Jesus has been leading us all these Sabbaths this fall to the realization that we need to rebuild that core relationship with Jesus in our lives. And so because I believe this applies to me as well, to everybody, as well as everyone else here, this is what I intend to do next week for that purpose. This is how I intend to act because Laodicea must act. So this is what I intend to do next week. This next week will be for me a week of fasting and prayer. My goal to sit at the table with Jesus until he reignites passion in my heart. Here's my strategy, because you can't act without a good plan, right? Number one, fast. Because fasting continually reminds me I have a purpose. I can set out in the morning with a purpose, but if there's nothing to remind me of it, by noon I've forgotten it. But I don't ever forget I'm hungry. So I won't forget my purpose. Two, commit to evening prayer together with any who will come here Monday through Thursday at 7 o'clock, Friday at 6 o'clock, because we need to pray together. Three, get up a half an hour earlier each day this next week so that I have time not just for my Bible reading and journaling, but also an extra half an hour of time to supplement it with reading. I'm going to read Steps to Christ every morning this next week. Four, intentionally setting aside another half hour during the work day to come into this sanctuary to pray and seek God's leading in my life. That's my strategy. That's my plan. Why? Because I hear knocking. And I want to answer that door. And I want to sit with Jesus, and I believe you do too. Do you hear the knocking? What will you do? Laodicea must act. Fasting. You know, I think one of the most important things about fasting is to prove you can say no to yourself for a whole week. You any good at saying no to yourself? 
Is there anything that the Lord would have you fast from this week so that you can stay focused on purpose? I want to challenge you to read a gospel this week. They're easy to find. They're right there at the beginning of the New Testament. Pick one you like. Read it. Pray every day this week intentionally on your knees. You have to make a plan to do that. And read something devotionally focused on the reality of Jesus, like Steps to Christ or Desire of Ages. Not just something theologically focused on the theory of Jesus. This isn't about talking with someone else about whether or not Jesus exists. This is about sitting with the risen Lord at the table. And you need to find a time to pray with your family, with your brothers and sisters in the faith. Joining us here in the evening is an option. Where are you on the continuum? Ephesus, need to warm up. Sardis, need to wake up. Laodicea, you need to act. Do you hear the knocking? Here's the promise to Laodicea. Here's what happens when you act. Verse 21, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. I don't think there is a higher promise made to any church. Verse 22, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It is hard to imagine a promise greater than these. Do you have ears? Do you hear knocking? Because I'm pretty sure I do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're going to need your spirit this week because there's plenty of things that could keep us from answering the door and sitting with Jesus. But I believe you've made this call in a strong way to all of our hearts. And when we gather one week from now, we have the opportunity to be different people. But we'll have to act. So Lord, I pray that we will notice your knocking and rouse ourselves from our slumber and shake off our lukewarmness and open the door and sit with you until the passion burns in our hearts again. In Jesus' name, amen.